Now, here's a conversation I had with one of the original conceptual adapters of the Broadway rock opera Rent, Billy Harrison, at the Purity Diner in Brooklyn on a Tuesday afternoon. I know it sounds like a song, but there's a lot more. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. <laughs> All right. We're, we're rolling. I think we're rolling. I feel like this is like a Robin Williams sort of kind of podcast where it's just like... Anywhere we want to go. Anywhere we want to go. So no secrets. No, no secrets. Noah. That was, yeah, right. <laughs> Big Brother's watching, man. Right. Um, so I'm Rostafa. I'm part of the Montclair uh, production of Rent that's happening June 7th to the 16th. And I'm sitting right here with... Billy Aronson. Billy Aronson, who is Jonathan Larson's... I, what do we want to say? Uh, collaborator or early collaborator? Yeah. Friend? Well, the official credit is original concept and additional lyrics. Which kind of explains it. I had this idea for... Uh, I, I, we collaborated on it together. I had this, should I tell you the story of it, or you already know? All the way back to the beginning. Okay. When I was new in New York in the mid '80s, um, I, I lived in a tiny apartment in Hell's Kitchen, and I had no room to do anything, including daydream. I didn't have my own room. I mean, there was a guy. I shared the quote-unquote living room, which was the size of a bedroom, with another guy. And so, if he was watching TV, I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Um, and I would walk up to the Lincoln Center and I'd discover the operas up there. My dad had always liked opera, so I got standing room. And I could watch them and just daydream or walk around. It was really cool. I recommend it. <laughs> and um, at the Met. And one of them that I liked the most was Bohem right in a way, partly because I identified with it. Because it's about these young artists who have absolutely, they're saying they have nothing, but they sing this gorgeous music and they have friendship and they have love. And I, at its best, I wanted to see my life that way. But at this time, this was the mid-80s, well, like when I would walk home to Hell's Kitchen from the Lincoln Center, things got darker and colder. And um, this was the time where we were just becoming aware of how terrible AIDS was, that crisis. So, and you could see it everywhere. Homelessness was on the rise. Um, Reagan had just been elected. It was sort of the beginning of that huge income inequality thing. So you could see homeless people. It was in fashion to have money. That shocked me. I mean, I grew up in the 70s and in high school. I thought, this is cool that I play the flute and I'm not going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, not so in the mid-80s. You go to a party, then what do you do? I'm a playwright. No, what do you do? What do you mean? <laughs> Jonathan was the same way, actually. Yeah, he was working right. at the diner. We shared that. It was humiliating. It was tough. Your parents don't get it. Um, anyway, so uh, I, wanted, I got the idea. This would be a cool story to tell. To take Bohem and do it for now, the hard edge uh, reality that we're in. Uh, still beautiful, still with love, but, you know, grounded with its feet in the ground, not luscious. I want to actually kind of bring it back. So, like, your father, you said, had a love for opera. Yeah, he loved it. What was it about opera that was compelling other than, let's say, just, say, regular musical theater or mm -hmm. just music in general of the times? What was it about opera that was appealing mm -hmm. both to you and your father, you think? Mm -hmm. Well, for me, it's high art. It's gorgeous. It's breathtaking. It blows me away the most. It's rare that a musical does that to me. Uh, I enjoy musicals, but it's not like I grew up, you know, knowing every Sondheim song. Or um, I, I just didn't think that that's what I would be drawn to do. You know, I was I wanted to, I was inspired by you know Samuel Beckett and Harold Pinter. Oh God, I love Samuel Beckett. Great art. Love Shakespeare. You know. Sorry. Yes. But um, but opera, yeah. It, well, I didn't realize it when I was young and my dad was playing this music, but it's, it's, it's like, well, I mean, Shakespeare was a big inspiration, and it's like that in music. It's high art. It's about something very complex and beautiful about life. Uh, and it, it, it doesn't, it's not popular entertainment. I mean, Shakespeare is also popular entertainment, but at any rate, so that, I got that. And I got that in Bohem, there was something that really captured love more than a pop song does um, in that opera. Um, and that stayed with me. I thought there's something wise about it and the, and the struggle that it is to, to live. And, and kind of bring us back, because again, I'm part Italian, you may not know because I'm a brown guy, but on my mom's side, she's yeah. French, Irish, and Italian. And the Italian side of my family were obviously aware of Italian culture. And it got, yeah. a, and Puccini, yeah. in a lot of ways, that's like his, he's considered his most infamous work, mm -hmm. but in a lot of ways was not really as celebrated as we got into the mid part of the 20th century. And you lost that because of the stereotyping of if you were in a specific type of art, you were a pansy, you were a mm -hmm. geek, you were mm -hmm. this or that. Mm -hmm. And the production that you saw, was it an English production? Was it the original Italian production? How were you able to make out with the characters? You saw? <laughs> it was uh, the, the Mets. They call it a war horse because it's been on for so long. I think they're still doing the same one that I saw. It was the sets and the direction by Franco Zeffirelli, who likes everything gorgeous and luscious, and it was beautiful to look at um, in Italian. They didn't have subtitles in those days, so I read the su summary. 
I didn't know exactly what they were saying, but I could feel it. That's what I loved about it. Yeah. You could feel that music. You could feel it. Da, da. He's soaring when Pavarotti sings that. You know, he's he, <laughs> uh, he's the Roger character. Um, it's just, well, I get it. This is gorgeous. This love just transcends the snow and the cold and the diseases that they have. Um, so I think that was... Yeah, and, and I think one of the things that I remember from the documentary No Day But Today, and you were describing how the original Mimi, how she fell in love over the candle, which we'll get into like those yeah, things yeah. with Rent. And in the fourth and final act, unlike Rent, Mimi dies. Yeah. What was it about Mimi dying? Obviously, when any character dies, there's a certain sense of emotion that a, a, an audience should feel. Specifically with Mimi, what was it about her that was spellbounding for you mm -hmm. and just how that death was so emotional and so gut-wrenching mm -hmm. due to the fact that we're dealing with, again, 19th century issues including disease at that time, mm -hmm. but in also trying to live their life as artists? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it, trying to live your life as an artist. People were dying, a lot of whom had chosen to make their lives as artists. And you're, you're starting off when you decide to be an artist in the hall because you're, you're going to be poor. Right. Certainly in the beginning and for a long time. And she's doing something that she loves and trying to make money. And she deeply loves this guy. And she's deeply in love. But it's hard. They're arguing a lot. They're fighting all the time. Partly because they're poor and partly because they're, they're young lovers. They're artists. Artists have our intense personalities. Right. When right. we fall in love with each other, we argue a lot. <laughs> and just kind of explain, what were kind of like the arguments that you can make out even at that time that Mimi and Rodolfo had? Because unlike Roger and Mimi in the yeah, show, yeah, yeah. it's mainly over drugs. It's mainly over, she might have had the hots for Benny at one point, mm -hmm. which is kind of explained later yeah, on yeah, in yeah. La Vibo M. It was more about money. As I recall, she's poor and she's dying and he knows he can't help her, so he's gonna to try to break up with her. They've been living together, which in those days was revolutionary. <laughs> um, and this is all taking place in what setting? Uh, where, where was the town, what was the... Uh, I don't know, I forget, was it in Paris? But um, it's French and they, they live in a garret, which yeah, is the thing garret, my mother right. told me. You can be an artist, just promise me you won't live in a garret. Right. She did not know that in New York you can't afford a garret. You know, so I was lucky enough to find a garret. And again, and again, and I our, shared it. And our, like, you know, grandparents, great grandparents, it, like, that was, like, commonplace for them in, yeah. like, in terms of, like, the slum, type, yeah. you know, deal. And of course, obviously, in the late 1800s, I mean, transitioning yeah. to 1900s, even in New York, yeah. there was so, almost like a reflection, even though that the Industrial Revolution had kind of already started, mm -hmm. just right after slavery. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember the film, but Leonardo DiCaprio's in it, and it's in New York. Gangs of New York. Gangs of New York, <laughs> and it's just really, really rough, and it's just almost like a death sentence. Like, cops can barely yeah. uphold yeah. these rallies and these gangs. Mm -hmm. So, kind of going towards the 80s, so you're aware that AIDS is around. Yeah. You're aware that the drug scene is getting even more and more dangerous because coming out of the 60s, which was innocent enough, yeah. got into the harder drugs of the 70s, and by the time we got into the 80s, crack heroin is practically all over the country, in particular, at least on the East Coast, where, especially in New York, where you're just seeing a lot more homelessness, not even just in terms of lack of money, but more so of mental health. Did you ever go to CBGB's? You know, like what you're- I've been there, yeah, a You've long been time there? ago. Now, what was like the atmosphere, because again, there are a lot of people that might, that might be in my cast that weren't necessarily alive during that time, yeah. so like, kind of give like an idea of what that atmosphere was, because it's punk rock, not yeah, 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 country yeah. bluegrass yeah, and blues. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was very, very loud. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember jumping, like pogoing, jumping straight up and down, which is fun, it's great exercise. Right. And it, it's very aggressive and it's very angry, which is cool. Um, musically, I, you know, it wasn't as subtle as a, mm -hmm. if you could combine that in opera, which is sort of what Jonathan did in a way, somewhere in between, so you're, mel I love melody, and I love chords, to tell you the truth, they move me and excite me. Um, but I also love the spirit of punk. I love that spirit, I still do. I mean, the attitude. That's what you yeah. always want. Young people raging. You want to tap into what is it that people are so angry about? And young people have the, have the fresh insight because they see that what older people see with perspective and history and they're aware of the subtlety. But young people can just look at the world and say, wait a minute, something is wrong. It's wrong killing people in Vietnam. Wait a minute, I see the narrative about it's like Hitler, but you know what? This is not, this is, look at what you're doing. I always related Jonathan to um, Pete Townsend. Uh -huh. And here's the reason why. Pete Townsend had a project called Lifehouse. Uh -huh. That was what became Who's Next, the album. Yeah, right, right. And Lifehouse was the concept of 
how advertisers, producers, filmmakers saw somebody in life. And that basically the common thread, apparently what Roger Daltrey said in interviewers, if we find the meaning of life, it's a musical note. Mm. And that was like the concept. Yeah. But the concept was going so far-fetched into some futuristic stuff, kind of like what Jonathan went through when he made Superbia. Mm -hmm. And it was just, he was losing it. He was yeah. losing it. So they ended up compromising, and as Jonathan did, and he made Tick, Tick, Boom with yeah. certain songs that came from Superbia, I believe, yeah. and was added. When you got the idea to do an adaptation of mm -hmm. Lava Wham, mm -hmm. what was like the initial impulse, the mm -hmm. initial catalyst that said, you know what, all the elements, you have the drugs, you mm -hmm. have the lifestyle, you have the mm -hmm. attitude, you mm -hmm. have the disease. Mm -hmm. What was like, because I, I think when I was talking to Victoria Hoffman, who was a friend of Jonathan's, she said that, from your perspective, you're like almost like a very comedic sort of kind of like, person in a way where it's like you kind of like look at something and say I can make a farce out of that this that but at the same token you wanted to talk about the seriousness mm -hmm. of it all so I'm that, more um, well I told you like Samuel Beckett or Pinter yeah these guys they're very serious but there there's an irony about it you don't just come no one in Beckett just comes downstage and said uh, I love you but I'm dying you know right help me it, it, it's um they're they capture both at the same time, funny and serious. In fact, they capture the serious because it's funny. They see what's funny in the weirdness of being alive. That's what I like to do. Now, what I didn't get about Jonathan is um, his work is, uh, I would say, very direct and open emotionally. At the time, I thought this is melodramatic. Now, I, I, I don't mean that in a bad way. It's just not what I was used to writing. Writing words like, I love you, I'm dying for God's sake, you know, save me, don't leave the, me. Like the literal. There's literal, the expressive, literal, and his music is very open hearted and emotional. Um, and I didn't get, well, how is that, is that, I mean, if, are these guys heroes and then the people with money are bad? Are they, I always see everybody as sort of odd, as sort of troubled in some way, yeah. fighting to survive in some way. And he really saw the, the good guys, there were good guys and bad guys, uh, and the good guys, and the bad guys are so evil, they were unredeemable, which, which troubled the early drafts of Rent. Skipping ahead, I, see, I can see in retrospect that it worked because melodrama is great. Especially on great art. especially TV as well, because my you know back in the day our grandparents or parents were like I'm gonna watch my stories mm -hmm. right they're mm -hmm. gonna watch General Hospital they're yeah. gonna watch that but the funny thing is is that even in Rent now when you look at the comedy that's there it, for me as a viewer it was warranted because you looked at the 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 character development mm -hmm. and how you can look at something like for example which by the way is a true story how Jonathan's relationship or one of his first relationships outside of high school was with uh, I believe her name was Brenda I want to make sure that's <laughs> that's there and basically had an affair with another woman so for us it's like oh my god that's funny but then for whoever's in the mix thank you whoever's in the yeah, mix things happen. It, it it's a little bit you know, yeah. the pride comes out, and you're yeah, like, what yeah. the heck? And Jonathan was hurt by that. Yeah. Very curious, because even in La Boheme, uh, there's a lot of, there's some comedy in there that even you can reckon back towards, like, let's say, yeah. even Shakespeare or even Brecht, which Brecht is actually one of my favorites, because he wants to let you know you're watching a play. Oh, yeah. He's basically attacking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's flipping with your intelligence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So... With La Boheme, would you feel like the comedy was, even though of another era, it definitely translated even a hundred years later, when, especially like you know, when you saw it for the first time? There, there, is light, there are light moments between uh, in those two, and um, um, Musetta is a really funny character who freaks out all the time. Right. But, I mean, Boheme is... Um, it, the reason I wanted to write uh, the thing that became Ren is because it, it, it didn't seem now. It didn't seem the hard-edged strangeness. It wasn't truly weird. It was comforting. Mm. Uh, beautiful, but in a way, comforting. You know? And I, Rent is not. And, uh, well, I guess it is in a way, but um, in a different way. It has more edge and, the, and a different kind of wit. So, I mean, it, it wasn't though, I, I mean, there are things I love about Bowen, but it wasn't, if it did everything I wanted, if it was a complete work to me, I wouldn't have wanted to do a new, say, That's I wouldn't have said, wanted to say, oh, but check this out. That's true. You know? That's true. Because again, I mean, Sondheim did it with West Side Story, which again, yeah. to me, was the only way I can relate to it from that perspective, because West Side Story is loosely based off Romeo and Juliet. Right. 
and it was just taking place instead of in a European Victorian kind of time. This is taking place on the streets of New York. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. badass is that? Mm -hmm. And then, mm -hmm. even though that it was very theatrical music, Sondheim still captured the New York attitude, which is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. A little pause for the cause. Regrettably, there was part of our conversation that was excluded, and that's a hidden fact. Allegedly, somebody that Billy Aronson knew recommended potentially a space in Montclair, New Jersey to potentially host this idea of an adaptation of La Boheme. Just a little fun fact. Where, how did you come across Jonathan? How did you come across his work and who introduced you to him? Right. I went to, well, I don't write music, but I wanted to write this thing that would be a musical. Because I, write, I write, was writing plays, but I wanted to get, I'd already had people waiting, to, reading the play, I was waiting, I said, I want to do something different now because I don't want, I don't want to start another play just yet. So uh, I went to Playwrights Horizons, a theater, the first theater that was interested in me in New York, and they, have, they do musicals. So they recommended me to two composers I thought would be good for my project. One was Adam Gittle, a very successful and a genius. I love his music. And Jonathan Larson. I didn't know either of them at the time, but I met them both, listened to their songs. Uh, Adam didn't want to do something with the contemporary political thing. And, uh, and Jonathan right away was really interested in this idea. I mean, I, I, I would have done some other ideas. He had another idea he wanted to, he'd, he'd come, he'd approached me with. Um, Where did you meet him, by the way? Where? I, first we left scripts off for each other, and then we met on his rooftop to talk about them. As I and isn't it true that he asked you to pick a... Yeah, 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 yeah. He, he t oh, so basically, uh, Jonathan asked him, hey, pick a pallet, or like some yeah, type yeah. of like there, stool. There was a lump on the roof. <laughs> he, he kept it. It was warmish out, I think. It was maybe Summertime? Spring. Yeah, maybe spring, late spring. And that he had a beach chair up there, and maybe another chair, but there was a lump. That was like if you had three people, you'd have to use it. But, and I was there at the house. It was recently. Oh, yeah. so. How do you like that? Oh, it's beautiful. So anyway, I was, we were up there on the roof. He, he had me climb up a, a, a ladder. Right. To, it was a little scary for me. You were young. And <laughs> I was young. Yeah. Um, and, and then we just talked. And right off the bat, he said some things that were true of the show, that what it eventually became. He said... It was time for our generation's hair, and that he wanted to bring uh, the MTV generation, by which he meant us, MTV was new at the time, uh, back to the theater. And, and that's something that's very interesting, because I always found the 80s being almost like a transitional time. In the 80s, though, the MTV generation started. It was the, you know, the, the, the coming of other elements coming together with not just MTV. Yeah. I mean, Video Kill the Radio Star, you know, rock and wrestling. You had all these different elements happening. And then it almost seemed like Broadway was just lost in the shuffle. It seemed mm -hmm. like theater in general, mm -hmm. especially in New York, was mm -hmm. lost in the yeah. shuffle. True. And granted, you had some pretty good works like straight plays and little things like that, but... Yeah. It almost seemed as if there was this emptiness mm -hmm. in a society that was coming of age that, again, like in the 60s, wanted to represent them. Mm -hmm. There was hair. There was Godspell. There was Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, later, there would be dream girls for the African-American community, but it wasn't like a worldwide phenomenon yeah. like, like you would see in movies, like The Godfather or something right. like that. Right. I want to tell you, by the way, Jonathan, yeah. when he described his music to me well, before we exchanged materials, he said, I write good FM rock. If that helps, I, I would think Steely Dan, or I, I don't know what, what you would think. But I mean, he didn't ever explain what it meant, but um, whatever it was, something happening in the eighties. And by the way, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Steely Dan. Yeah, they're and, so smart, yeah. right? Smart rock. Incredible. What I, when I think of FM, I think well, they don't they have a few hits, but mainly you go to listen to their album oriented. Stuff. Asia is probably the best. Yeah, album. right. But um, so you guys meet, you talk right. about that this could be the hair of our generation. Yeah. And you're right about the theater. There was nothing. The, the things that were praised were just musicals were like for children. Cats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm a fan of the opera. No disrespect. Yeah. But it's just like... It's entertaining, it, but it was... It, it was there to make money. That's and they weren't, the, the things you mentioned weren't even American. I don't yeah, think, right? So right. there just wasn't much American theater. Besides, you know, Sam Shepard had a few great plays. But in general, they didn't know... There was one year they just didn't give out Ovies for playwriting. There was just nothing. But anyway, go on. So... The MTV concept. Now, Jonathan's apartment, for those of you who have never witnessed it or never seen the documentary, was literally just a random 
hole, I don't want to call it a hole in the wall, but it was just like a, a four, five story walk up, very funky building. He's got a keyboard in the corner. He's got his little computer, which God bless him. That's how he wrote his scripts. Yeah. And just books Doc and Matrix albums <laughs> and yeah. tapes. And I can only imagine when he's, after he has this conversation with you, he has a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah, Because yeah. he, oh, he, he just came off of Superbia, which yeah. did nothing, barely. Yeah. You came up with, I believe, like a swath of text to, like, to kind of get the juices flowing mm-hmm. for him to write. Kind of explain like, what that 15-page document was and like, what it really referred to in terms of what you can recollect based upon like, what you wanted to intend. Right. Well, the hard thing was I hadn't collaborated before like this, and neither had he. So we loved each other's... We love the, the idea of working together, but it was very hard to just to really get started. I was used to doing everything exactly the way I wanted it, because I learned in drama school, don't ask anybody else how you should do your thing, or they're going to tell you they're wrong, if you're doing anything unusual. Mm-hmm. So, and he was the same way, you know, in suburbia, what he wrote everything, and he, in a lot of the stuff he's acted in it too. <laughs> so um, it was very hard for us to do anything that wasn't exactly the, in our own voice. So right off the bat, as I tried to imagine something right for him, I really struggled. I wrote some crappy pages that were just pointless and terrible. And then I, and then I just said, I can't, you know. And he was getting frustrated because he said, I want something to work on. And it was taking longer than it should have. How so, long did it take? Months. I don't remember. You know, maybe by the, in the fall I got him something good. So it was throughout the summer. But it was, like a, it was basically like a rough draft, assuming. Yeah, I got him, you know. But so then I had... Um, we had a, an outline for the four scenes. They were going to parallel the four acts and level in. And then, or the four act, whatever, acts, scenes, whatever. And then uh, finally I said, okay, fuck it. I'm not going to think about pleasing. I'm just going to write stuff that I love. And, and I told this to him. And what did you love? Like, what, what, was, the, what was coming out of it? Complex, you? angry, weird. And, and I just, so I, and in lyrics. So I just wrote, if I threw my body off the da 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 the rhythm of the rent song, da 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 hardboard bed, da 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 and I heard the first verse, which was the original yeah. <laughs> verse for Red. Through my body, out the window, brains all splattered, yeah, guts all right. steaming in the snow. My first reaction was, all the church people that are going to be watching this are going to be gone. Right. <laughs> all the straight people are going to be gone. <laughs> and yet, the attitude was there. And I remember yeah. you said in the documentary that the energy is there. It's, yeah. There's something there. So you bring this to him. Now... How long did it take for him to call you, like, well, come over to my apartment? Well, I don't want to skip to the fact that it yeah. followed that scene with Santa Fe exactly as it is now. And then, and a couple scenes later was I Should Tell You. A lot of how it is now. Uh, then I got it to him. He loved them. We either, that was the trouble with our, as a collaboration, you've got to pick at things. Um, and you guys were not in the same room when you kind of, like, wrote... No, we stuff. should have been. You're right. Like, I, it was like, I never it was read like, it to him. It was like Elton John and Bernie Taupin. Yeah, which can work. But I should have been there, read it to him. We should have talked it out. What do you like? You like this lyric? You like that? You know, you don't like this? Why? It said it was like, I love it. And in the past, it would have been, I hate it. You know, I just hate it. I love it. Yeah. I think it's just because Jonathan was just, he liked to just yeah, work like right. clockwork. And I don't think he liked to think about something for too long. Yeah. He just wanted to I get it right. out there. Yeah. And also, remember, this is the same guy that wrote a song a day. Yeah. Like, he is, like, he'll, and he did that as an exercise. Yeah to get his juices flowing. Yeah. When you guys kind of discovered the the process of like, okay, we got these three tracks, that which were Rent, I Should Tell You, and Santa Fe. This is actually what I wanted to talk about with you. Santa Fe. Yeah. It's actually one of my favorite songs, if not my favorite song hey, on the show. Here, I love you. Here's the reason why. It is the bluesiest theater song yeah. I have ever heard For theater, in right. my life. And mind you... This is not a normal Memphis kind of blues. This is not a Texas kind of blues. This is not a Chicago kind of blues. It's a New York blues. Cool. And it's a very specific New York blues, like a yeah. 20s, 30s. Like James Lipton, who interviewed Billy Joel, when he said, New York State of Mind is a blues song. Why Santa Fe? What was it about Santa Fe, the place? Yeah. Why Santa Fe, instead of, let's say, Colorado, or I want to go to LA, or I want to go to Toronto. Well, why Santa Fe? What was it about that you wanted to at least write a song about that? Yeah, well, I'd been there the summer, a couple summers before. Um, and I used to fantasize, I was living with artist friends, and we used to fantasize, let's just get the hell out of here. And because it's an artistic community, you know, we could be, make artists, and it's beautiful. The mountains and the air, and a lot of 
Brooklyn type people, hip, you know, a lot of hip people. They would just all go to Santa Fe, New Mexico. That was the fantasy. Oh, it was the fantasy. We would never really do that. I mean, oh, so it wasn't. It wasn't I like a Jack Kerouac it. kind of. A, no, kind of I a didn't field. do it. I mean, maybe there are other people who did. I never left to go to San. I, I vacationed there and I seen it and I thought, wow, this is a cool place. And I loved New York. I wasn't going to leave New York, but when you're, it's just so, when you're feeling ugly and and discriminated against and made fun of and. New York is so noisy, and it's so impossible to get anybody to read your work. I mean, that's part of what Jonathan was feeling, is that he'd already been through Superbia, which had every kind of reading you can have, and it didn't get done. And although our to- you know, the way he talked about it, it, I didn't understand how it would be the... I didn't think it would be on Broadway, I'll be honest with you. I thought, that sounds crazy now. Right. How can you imagine, you know, of course it would be on Broadway, but it was there was nothing like it. Mm-hmm. I thought off Broadway, like a place like Playwrights Horizons, would be amazing. Mm-hmm. Maybe it would get extended, you know. Right. I almost feel that Jonathan almost took, took it almost like a punk rock attitude of, okay, I'm getting rejected. Screw this. Mm-hmm. Let me write what I want to write. If it somebody doesn't like it, I don't care. I like it. Were you like in that same vein when it came to like writing, writing kind of certain kind of attitudes in plays or even just in the collaboration in general with Jonathan? I'll, I'll be clear. We both wanted to get it done. We didn't want to waste our time not getting something done. I mean, we—I mean, we wanted to love it. Like we, we weren't. There was no question of going ahead with. In fact, that this went along with it. We have to love it a hundred billion percent, right? Um, because we need it to get done. I mean, like we're not making it just to listen to it with each other or play it at a party. This is our career. It has to get, or why waste our fucking time? Right. You know, we don't want to waste our, we felt old in our 20s. Well, I should tell you. Yeah. When you're, when you're a, a, a teenager and you start going through the puberty stage and stuff like that, you're kind of like going, yeah, but no, you don't want to open up your feelings. You don't want to, because you don't want to feel soft, right? Right. But when you watch or listen to that scene, there's something in you that goes, okay, we're both kind of nervous. We're both yeah. kind of, we want to say it, but we are nervous about what the reaction is going to be from the other. And the original lyrics in that is actually very dark and, and very, but in the, but because in the revised lyrics, it's a little bit more simple. Okay. Yeah. But you know, and stuff. But when you go back to those original lyrics or whenever you read them back, whenever you get a chance to like, and you saw the evolution of that, what was your, like, did you see, did you see it as almost like a darker kind of scene or did you see it as like a, this is like confession. This is like my, yeah. I want to confess my love. I want to confess my feelings, yeah. despite what the yeah. outcome would be. It's basically like what I imagined. I realize um, I can see what you mean about a little. My character was was as one of the one who was going to throw himself out the window if something. Didn't, so he's still that guy. But I still think both of them, both in that situation and in general, when you're coming up and you don't haven't established yourself yet, for me there was always a kind of a shame in it. And I didn't feel I deserved to be loved. And I was, I was in all these crazy relationships because I don't, should I get into it? But I don't, how can I commit? And what if I get, what if my work doesn't allow me, you know? And we argued all the time. So it was a sort of yes and no at the same time. But I wanted to, and they want to. And that's actually and the best answer do. I could have ever got. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yes and no. Yeah. Jonathan, and, and of course, obviously you and everybody around that time, the AIDS crisis was mm-hmm. really rampant. Well, there was also that. And yeah. the AIDS crisis was was so discriminatory against people that were of a different yes. ilk. And yes. more than that, you could have been hetero and still got it. Yeah. And not only that, you could have got shot up, blood transfusions. Yeah. Um, and please remind me, the, the name of the of the child uh, back in the 80s where he had passed away, Elton John was like a... Oh, Ryan White. Yeah, Ryan, right, Ryan White. It was so angry to people that Reagan had found out about it and didn't say anything for three years. Yeah. And 100,000 people were already yeah, dead. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, did you have any friends that had gone through that and had died? Or yeah, like, yeah. Like kind of, it kind of explored that a little bit. Well, I want to, first of all, I want to say that at the time when we wrote it, straight people were also scared because they were saying, okay, it's just a matter of time. It's going to spread to everybody. Because a few people, you know, there, there are women who have been with guys who were both. and. It's going to be all, all over everywhere. So we were all scared to death to have sex. There was the question, is even a condom enough? Because this is deadly. You know, we're two. I'm fine, thank Yeah, you. we're two, we're three. Like, the yeah, paranoia. Yeah, I know. And it also... And then why bother? <laughs> and it didn't discriminate against black, white, rich, right, poor, gay, right. straight. And you had to talk about it. So, the, you know, it's not something you usually want to talk about when you haven't been intimate with someone. So you had to. And that was just weird. So there's part of that in the song. 
<laughs> but but yeah. then also, yeah, I knew friends. Everybody knew friends in, if you were in the theater community because it was it w would never be just one person. It, if it was one person, it was the entire group of friends. And how awkward was it like when you would find out somebody had the virus? Yeah. I mean, was there a sense of paranoia because of distance? Yeah. Was it a matter of what can I do? Because you feel helpless as, as somebody who doesn't have it. Right. And how can you relate to somebody yeah. that does have yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, it was terrible. Um, it, people died so terribly, so fast. Uh, that's all I could. I mean, you visit somebody in the hospital, and they've just after you found out that they've got it, and they're they're shriveled. And originally, it was terribly painful. And originally, I think it was called grid. Okay. I, originally, back in like the early eighties, yeah, right. and then obviously we knew what it was. Yeah. And. Comparatively speaking, from like 1983 to 95, it was a death sentence. Yeah, that's right. Because there was, cause the ACT wasn't really that mm -hmm. kind of drug. Mm -hmm. And by the time you got to 95, I mean, granted, yeah, we got things down, but it was still rough. Yeah. And you were pretty much dead. Oh, yeah. And Nobody survives it. Yeah. And of course, like, you know, guys like, you know, the character of Mr. Brady, yeah, Freddie right. Mercury, yeah. celebrities, you know. It's just and, awful. Great playwrights. This guy, Harry Condolian, my favorite playwright at the time, died, and then you never hear about it. He was, just, he was young. So, going back towards, like, okay, obviously, you and John, there's a, there's a point where it's just like, he puts it on the shelf for a little right, while, right. and you guys are talking, yeah. but it's just like... We didn't know what to do with it, because yeah. again, we didn't really have a common language. You know, your thing is, I find it to this, I find your thing to that, it's just... people. We passed around, people weren't responding to it. We had three great songs and a story, and they said, okay, I don't know what to do with this. At least that's... Um, so then, as I said, we didn't want... We, we, had, we were both very impatient. There's no way we're going to spend working on something that might be a waste of our time. Especially with all other factors in life coming at yeah, you. Yeah, right. That. But Jonathan, somehow, he calls up one of his friends, Legend Goes, and he says, what do I do? Yeah. How do I, because I, I, I want to work on this, but Ira I don't Weitzman, know what to do. Who's right? the guy who brought us together. At what was his name? Right. Ira Weitzman. He's still, at, he's now at the Lincoln Center doing the same thing. He brings people together to do musicals. So, he writes a letter to you. And actually, I have the letter with me. Do you mind if I read it? Please. <laughs> okay. I, I remember it. Yeah. Okay. Because this letter, and again, he's not a lawyer. He's not like a... I might have written the letter, but go on. Okay, so, Bill, as per our phone conversation, yeah. I'm planning, with your permission, to go ahead and continue working on Rent. If any such miracle right. as a production, which, by the way, I love how he terms miracle. Right. As a production happens, I'll give you credit for original concept and any lyrics of yours that I use. At such time, we'll obviously draw up an official, a more official agreement, so you'll be fairly compensated for your work. Thanks for the green light. Isn't that nice? Yeah. And again, there wasn't any hard feelings, because again, this was no, something no. that you had originally had adapted, but it kind of, I don't want to say it got away from you, but it was one of those things where it's like, you know what? Let it live. Let yeah. it live. Yeah, I didn't... I didn't in retrospect, it seems insane to do that, but at the time it just made perfect sense. Like, he thinks he can do something with it, great. I have lots of ideas for shows. And then, or t You know, one of my gigs was writing for TV, where they, I'd bring in an idea and they'd, they'd give you some money to develop it. And then you say, oh, this is going nowhere. Please, just take it and do what you want with it. And even with the pitch in a lot of those meetings, because yeah. basically you're a salesperson at that point. Right, and, right. It, and there's a fine line between I'm an artist, but then I'm a businessman. Right. And yeah, no hard I wanted him to do it. And he sent me stuff, you know. And let's talk about that. So, like, he's working on it for, yeah. like, five years, I yeah. would assume. And he's just typing away. Yeah. He is playing away. Yeah. When he would send you stuff, like, because obviously there's, there's a lot of testimony where there was some good stuff. There was some not so good stuff. There was some out there stuff. Kind of tell me, like, when you got the tapes or yeah. when you got the stuff, what was your initial reaction when you're listening to this? Especially when it's only one guy and a keyboard. Yeah, right, right. Well, um, you're right, it was all over the place. I mean, some of it was, he didn't really know how to do what he wanted to do. He's angry, so how angry, how good is, how angry can you be without losing the audience, you know? Um, but he wrote great songs, I mean, so uh, it was all over the place. It, it was too long, always what he sent me, but there was always great stuff in it. Always. I mean, I think the first thing he sent me had, would you light my candle in it? And I could see he's really on to something. I mean, he's, he, there's something in there that he really is right for him. Like this, this match of this story, and I think because of the AIDS and he was, had friends who were dying, we all had friends who were dying, it was very, he had to do something about it, and he got that. Let's talk about Light My Candle, because that okay. was like the song yeah. that 
when New York City Workshop picked that right. up was like that's the introduction yeah. that's our pitch yeah. and also same thing with Kevin McCollin who was one of the producers right. when you first listen to that song yeah. again maybe not be the biggest fan of theater you're more fan of opera could you find the correlation between the two in that song, especially with the humor? Yeah. Well, it really worked. I mean, as I say, I had my reservations about musicals, but this was adult. It was perfect. I mean, it, it just it expressed the situation in a mature and a hip way, but it, it, it you know there was no sen- it was no sentiment about it. It's a great scene. Uh, it's, it, it's a beautiful scene, yeah, yeah. Um, especially if you listen to like the foreign versions and how they kind of depict it in oh, a way, because really? they have a very sensual, like especially the French version, which I thought was absolutely hilarious. Um, cool. So we're going towards New York City Workshop. Right. He's telling you that he wants to bring it there, or you know, he didn't tell me that. Oh, he didn't tell you. No, I didn't know where he was bringing it. At the time, they didn't do musicals. <laughs> no, they didn't. They didn't. I mean, he didn't want. He, he didn't talk me through where it was going to go. I mean, I was technically it was it was his thing at this point, but uh, it was more about the work. He wanted he actually wanted feedback. What do you think of this? So I'd give him feedback, and it was generally cheerleading. Wow, because <laughs> I really appreciate what he's doing, and I couldn't tell exactly how to get it where he wanted it to go either. Did you go to any of the workshops early on? No. Um, it's, I wish I had, but uh, well, well, I mean, you've heard the stories basically where. They were very long, as you said. Yeah. Audience were leaving by the time it was intermission. Yeah. And those that were left over, because Jeffrey Sellers, who was a friend, but at also at the same time being a producer, is like, listen, you got to know what the story is. And would you say, it's safe to say that Jonathan wasn't a proper, like, narrator, conceptual yeah. a storyteller? Because through the music, it's great, right. but he, he just didn't know how to connect it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> you know, what we call book writing in a musical is not easy. And that wasn't his thing. He wrote really good lyrics and songs. But, um, so, I mean, in the end, it's the kind of musical where that's, it's, it's in there subtly. A lot of great storytelling, but it took a while to get to and to, to cut things. And a lot of people gave input. It was not, oh, yeah. I'm not the only collaborator. Tim um, Weil. Right. Uh, Kevin, of course. I think everybody who came along said, why My, do we need this yeah. scene? Um, but I did see it at New York Theatre Workshop, that workshop production, which was terrific. But yeah, I mean, I, I came with a friend who was in the musical theatre, and he left in intermission. Because it was two hours in the first half. But it was great. I mean, some of it was so good. Yeah, I, I think it was because if you look at the original Broadway debut, mm-hmm. there are certain things that is not on the album. Right. Which we'll talk about. Because, like, for example, like in uh, Christmas Bells, yeah. there's a slightly extended portion that they cut. Mm. I think it was just because, as you said, they were still developing it. Yeah. Even in previews and even also as it went on to do sh- oh. weeks. While the waiter gave us the bill, I asked Billy a little bit about how he felt about John's passing, as well as the historical factor of how successful Rent became, as well as what he wants to remember most about John. But this is kind of the hard part where I kind of want to discuss about the end result with John. Yeah. Uh, Story goes, he's at the New York City workshop. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's the last preview, or the last, like, kind of, like, you know, dress rehearsal. Right, Right. And audience goes nuts stomping on the floor he gets interviewed by Anthony Tomasini from the New York Times which I'm still trying to get a hold of him so knock on wood we'll get a hold of him he has the interview he says goodbye he goes home he makes a cup of tea collapses because up until that point he had had chest pains uh, and he was misdiagnosed and he passes away and he found by his roommate uh, Brian Carmody who now lives in I believe in California um Jonathan Burkhart was called by Brian to come over and he saw Jonathan lying on the floor with a cop standing over him which was very just out of body experience kind of a thing how did you hear about Jonathan's passing and where were you? I was writing for a show called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego my favorite one of my favorite that shows that was a great show right? oh thank you for doing that and I, you're welcome and I was it was a short gig where I was in house for a while so I beeped in People used to beep into their phone machines, you know what I'm even talking about? Yeah. And it said, my friend Rusty McGee, I was writing something with this guy, Rusty McGee, a composer. Um, and he said, hi, it, it's, it's Billy, it's uh, Rusty. I'm wondering if you heard the awful news about Jonathan Larson. Call me. So I thought, oh, shit, what? And then I called him and he told me. And, uh, yeah, I was just stunned. Because I'd talked to him a couple days before. We were going back and forth about what the program notes, what my bio would be in the program. And um, so, yeah, I was shocked. 
um, I had two young kids at the time. I, I was 96, so my youngest was two, and I had one who was four, and there was a huge snowstorm. Um, so I was home with the kids. I didn't go into the... Um, they were going to do a sing-through, and they were good enough to call me to come here. And all, but, uh, I missed that. I didn't know what to do. But anyway... I don't think really a lot of people knew either, yeah. because um, the story goes that everybody met up at the theater, mm -hmm. and it's just bewilderment mm -hmm. and Jonathan Burkhardt had called John's parents mm -hmm. and says what do you want to do about the show tonight and they said the show has to go on and Jonathan worked tirelessly for years on just anything and everything just to get something going now here it was now he's not here so they decided and the producer decided and Michael Greif the director decided we'll sing through the show no staging so basically you had three tables strung up across the stage. There was a few microphones and they just sang through. And I believe when they started with Out Tonight, there was a little bit of like some fervor. There was some, you know, gravitas. By the time they got to La Vibo M, they could not contain it. They had to get up. They had to dance. They had to sing. They had to push it. And it was very difficult because it's like you want to choke on your voice because you're so emotional about losing not just the creator but also who became a friend of the cast like he brought mm -hmm. the cast to his house for a peasant feast and I know you know about that stuff and he said at the peasant feast that you know we'll be like a family because you represent my friends that are no longer with me I always look at Jonathan as somebody who's very prophetic even when people thought he was crazy but that's most artists right like you, you proclaim something you say I am this I am that John wanted to complete something that was meaningful, again, to his generation. And he did that, but he wasn't here. When you heard that Rep was going to Broadway, what was your initial reaction and who told you? My lawyer. Uh, at that time, I, I have this entertainment lawyer who's also a theater producer who was dealing with the Larsons for me because I had to go to them and say, um, <clears throat> I have this piece of paper that says, that was pretty awkward. Um, you missed, I, I did see, I went to see a preview after he died, and that was incredibly emotional. It wasn't like anything else, it was too emotional, you don't want to have, but it was powerful, um, just seeing the show, because he, the show was so him, and so, you know, it's a cliche, it's like life imitating art, right. that he's gone, this is the climactic ending, right. he's gone, but he, here's the show now, it just was too perf too much like a story. And you don't want life to be that much like a story. It's annoying. The, were you there opening night? Yeah, I made it to opening night of the Broadway show. That where, was were you, where were you sitting? Second to last row. So you were in, so based on the balcony. Yeah, way back. So somebody filmed it and was on YouTube. If you uh, ever get a chance to, it's, it's not the best quality, but it's there. It, yeah. The energy's there. Celebrities are there. Yeah, yeah, a lot and, of celebrities. There were even celebrities at New York City Workshop. There was Steven Spielberg. There was right. Al Pacino oh, yeah. and stuff like that. So describe the energy in that room at the New Orlando, which, by the way, 41st. It's not 42nd. They're right. just below it, yeah, right? It's a cool theater. Um, well, when I saw it off-Broadway, it was really heavy. Great. Thrilling. Transcendent, but heavy. When I saw, on Broadway, uh, I felt happier about it. I felt like, um, well, the funny thing is, it's, there was so much glitter. Everybody was so dressed up. I'd never been to a Broadway opening. Everybody was so incredibly dressed. You know, the, the idea that this was to see a show that was about poverty, about not being incredibly dressed and being poor. And talking having, about marijuana, talking yeah. about, you know, and having and nothing. And everything was black on stage, and there's a bunch of pipes. But off stage was sparkle and, the, you know, the marquee and all that. And, cameras and the excitement and it was exciting it was weird because no one knew who I was that's okay but it was just kind of, I felt very clean like I could stay all the way in the back okay um, I was nervous because I didn't know if they cut my songs out and they hadn't <laughs> but uh, just watching it all from the back with my wife I, I felt very happy actually and proud so when Santa Fe came on and Jesse L. Martin singing it yeah that was cool because again originally he wasn't listed the, the character Collins was listed as kind of like a Joe Cocker Bruce Springsteen kind okay, of yeah, performer yeah, yeah. so they started looking for African Americans and I didn't even know this until I saw the doc Jesse L. Martin worked with Jonathan at the Moon. Oh, I did not. Oh, you didn't know, know that? that? No. They, he worked there. Crazy. And And funny enough, they it's were so like, good. it's like the same thing. You're, I'm an actor. No, well, I'm, you wait tables. Same thing. <laughs> from a personal standpoint, not from a professional, but from a personal, have you been cool with the Larson family in terms of just like, you know, after everything had gone down? 
whenever you get a chance. No sure. worries. You know, was there uh, was there at least a respect amongst you just based upon because again, you obviously was an early collaborator with right, John, right. and it had it been completely awkward just from the get go. Yeah. Well, yeah, it started off that way. I mean, and they're very sensitive about Jonathan getting. I mean, they have this tremendous amount of money now. Yeah. And they've been very good about uh, using it to make to um, help people that want to produce work and to get Jonathan's name out there and to make sure he's depicted a certain way. So it's tricky because anybody who wants to do the show has to please them because they control the rights to do the show. Yes. So that, yeah. that's why the school edition says certain things and doesn't say others, you know. And that's why you're allowed to do a certain kind of story about them and not others. That's why, you know. Um, but I think, yeah, we have a good relationship. We settle things nicely. What do you miss most about Jonathan? Boy, I wish we were around. That would be so cool to talk to him about all this. Uh, well, I would have liked what he have done for the, the American theater. I, he turned out to be, he became so good. I don't know, it might have been this was his one show, but that's okay. Uh, but it might have been, I wonder what would have been next. And I miss that. It would have been, we need it. There, who else is doing lots of, get going? Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, one last question uh, with this. What have you, what would you want to see depicted in Rent that, maybe has not been seen in quite a while, even from the original intention. Like, what would you want to see from a cast based on the characters, based on the music, and based on the legacy that is the the historical factor around the atmosphere of that time in the 80s and 90s that you would want to see in a production now? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, from, basically from the original intention. I can only tell you that Michael Greif was so good with that show. Everything he did with the casting... Um, and uh, and the cutting. I mean, he deserves a lot of credit. Of course, he's getting a lot of credit, and he's doing great. He's doing now. I think he just won an award now. I think he just did. Oh, really? I think he did. Yes. He's I think so Jonathan good. Burkhardt had told me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Billy. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll have you just like do a little thing for my cast or like that with my camera. Sure. Dude, it is so wonderful just to meet you. You're such a pleasing guy. You're very open and. Mustafa, it's great to meet you. Oh man. yeah, dude. I hope to stay in contact with you. And again, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, can you say just a little something for my cast if you don't mind? Sure. Good luck to to you all. It's a it's a beautiful play and um, it's about something really big and intimate at the same time. And you inspire people when you do this show. People see it and they think, hmm, maybe I could go into the theater or maybe I could go into politics. Or maybe, it just makes you want to be better and bigger and, uh, and it makes you think about, about how we treat each other. So um, Jonathan is, okay, I'm not a religious person, but they say he's watching over you and it means something because his spirit is all over the place. His spirit's all over his apartment right now. <laughs> right. I was there, and people have made that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I hope you have a great time with it.